The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds is one of the most fascinating entries in the entire series. A game that is simultaneously a remake slash reimagining of A Link to the Past, while also being a direct sequel to it and an entirely brand new game in its own right. Its basic outline and premise is very similar to A Link to the Past, hence a remake or reimagining, but it takes that premise and recontextualizes it, adding to it in a fresh way while still undeniably being built off of that game, hence a sequel in the vein of something like God of War Ragnarok. But it's also an original game because of its unique approach to progression and items, as well as how you access each of the dungeons once you get to low rule and its central mechanic of merging with walls. The game is truly a remarkable feat, and is easily the best Nintendo game of the Wii U era. It also acts as a transitional piece between Skyward Sword and Breath of the Wild, attempting to combine non-linear exploration and progression while still grounding it to the classic formula. Coming back to this game in a post Breath of the Wild world has brought to light a lot of things I never really considered before. Try as I might, I couldn't help but compare it in a lot of ways when writing the script. As such, I'd like to mention that it does have an influence on what I have to say throughout the video, though I'll only bring it up when it's actually relevant. The game may have its issues when it comes to its non-linear approach within a structure that traditionally relies on more linear elements, but it is still a fantastic game regardless. Let's get into why that is in this Link Between Worlds retrospective. The visual style of this game isn't one of my favorites. The art style very closely matches that of the art books from the first few entries in the series. It's not that it looks bad, it's just that I prefer the more hyper stylized looks of games like The Wind Waker, Skyward Sword, Breath of the Wild, and to a much lesser extent Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. Just because the art style isn't one of my favorites though, I won't deny that this game is graphically great. Everything just looks so polished. I particularly like how stylized the paintings of the characters like the sages and Link are. This is one pretty 3DS game regardless of my thoughts on the art style. I also like how they angled all of the models so that they would look better with the perspective of the game, which is something that you can kind of tell in game if you look at the grass when merged with a wall. They could have just used an orthographic camera like with the DS games, but I'm so glad they didn't because there's so much depth to everything here. Beyond just the graphical fidelity, the game is buttery smooth. The 2D Zeldas prior to the DS were somewhat archaic with how they felt to play, even if some games like A Link to the Past and Minish Cap were less so. The DS Zelda's control style led to a bit of a clunky feel, plus they were locked to a 30 FPS. The 3D Zeldas have a certain rhythm that you need to learn in order to really get into those controls, which is especially hard if you're playing the original N64 versions of Ocarina or Majora, since they are locked at a measly 20 FPS. Here though, the controls feel wonderful. Everything is so smooth and every action just feels right. There's no other Zelda game in the entire series where just moving feels good. Granted, it's not something that brings any of those games down, just something that elevates this game. The soundtrack here is also pretty good. All of the remixes of the themes from Link to the Past are especially fantastic. The Sanctuary theme stands out as the biggest glob for me. Instead of what sounds like strings, it focuses more on an organ and choir, which fits the tune a lot more in my opinion. I love how with Low Rules theme they went in with an unexpected direction, not giving it a grand adventure vibe until much later into the game. The original music created for this game is also pretty solid. I love the pre-invasion Hyrule Castle theme, it's so cheery and the brass gives it that royal feeling it needs, and I also like how the intro is a calmer version of the post-invasion Hyrule Castle theme. Yuga is one of the best themes of any antagonist in the series, Ravio's theme is wonderfully weird with a really fun sound, the Mother Maya Mai theme is a nice wholesome little tune, and I like the Milk Bar remixes of all the music as well. One of the many areas where A Link Between Worlds is a massive improvement over A Link to the Past is in the narrative. It's not one of the best stories ever told or anything, but I do think that it manages to be more engaging and interesting than a lot of the other 2D Zeldas. In fact, the only games that doesn't match in this regard are the DS entries, but within the confines of A Link to the Past story structure, I don't think that it ever really had a chance of that. The Seven Sages aren't some random maidens that you never even really see that much outside of when you rescue them, they're actual characters that you meet. Sure, none of them get much screen time or development, but they are absolutely more interesting. Gully is the first character you meet in the game, the son of the blacksmith Link is an apprentice to. There's this guy you meet at the Eastern Palace, who has a very condensed version of Gruus's arc. There's the Zora Queen, who you help in order to access one of Hyrule's dungeons. Ceres, who you see Yuga turn into a painting and is the closest to the original game's maidens. Rosso, who just looks cool. Impa, in one of her less interesting incarnations. And my personal favorite, Irene, the witch in training who acts as your fast travel companion. Whenever she's captured by Yuga, her broom turns up alone, which is a cute touch. Hilda is one of the most interesting antagonists of any Zelda game. A dark reflection of what Zelda could become. Much like how Hyrule had a Triforce, Lowru also had one, with similar consequences that came with a relic that powerful. But instead of sealing it away, in Lowru it was destroyed, sending everything into chaos. 
Hilda's motivations are simple yet effective. Desperate enough that she would send an entire other realm into the same despair that happened to Laurel just so she could restore her kingdom. Yuga, while not being the most interesting villain in the world in terms of motivation, is still at least enough of a threat that I don't really mind. The reveal that Ravio is an alternate version of Link is honestly one of the coolest twists in the entire series. It makes sense in hindsight, I mean why else would he have all of these tools and the bracelet that he gives just happens to be something that gives Link the ability to merge with walls as a painting. But it still isn't a super obvious twist on your first playthrough and I really like that. He was a coward and ran away when Hilda started going off the deep end, only coming back to talk her out of it at the end of the game with Link's bravery rubbing off on him a little. Is it as effective as Linebeck or Zelda from Spear Tracks' arc? No, but since the game doesn't have as much of an emphasis on story, I think that it really works within that context. Overall, while the game does look and sound great, and has a much more engaging plot than the majority of other 2D Zeldas that are in these three gems, the game offers much more than just that. So let's talk about it. It's impossible to talk about the overworld without first bringing up the game's approach to progression. Rather than obtaining items throughout the game, right from the start you have the ability to rent and then later on buy every main item from Ravio. This approach to items does have its issues when it comes to the dungeons, but we'll talk about that later. For overworld exploration, it's amazing. When people lament the lack of traditional items in Breath of the Wild, I can't help but feel like it's more of a natural, if a bit extreme, evolution of what this game started. Sure, it does have items like the bow, hookshot, boomerang, hammer, fire and ice rods, and they still function the same, but since you can get them at the start of the game, there's no longer a need to take note of something that requires an item you don't have. You'll just find something that the item is designed for and then be done with it. The runes are designed with the same philosophy, being tools to interact with the world above anything else. For whatever reason, A Link Between Worlds gets a pass though. See, I have never really feel like the Metroidvania elements were a part of what defined the series. Some Zelda games utilize those elements to strengthen what they were going for, like Link's Awakening, but for other games like the original, A Link to the Past, Spirit Tracks, Skyward Sword and Breath of the Wild, these elements are either minimal or practically non-existent. And generally, these elements were for the secrets and optional collectibles, never for main progression like in an actual Metroidvania. All that Zelda ever was in the past and ever needs to be in the future is an adventure. Sometimes that calls for looping back to areas previously explored with a new item to get a cool reward. Other times it only needs to offer an epic story. And sometimes it's just the freedom to explore the game at your own pace in your own way. A Link Between Worlds succeeds in the same way that Breath of the Wild succeeds, just on a smaller scale. Now the game doesn't just hand you every item in the game, it does lock the sand rod behind rescuing the sage from Thieves Town, and the titan mitts are the only item that are actually found within a dungeon. This adds a little bit more item progression to the game without taking away any of the fun of having a full arsenal right at the start. Once you die, Ravio will come to collect all the items that he owns, which on paper adds a risk reward system. You could carry as many items as you want, but in the process, if you die, then you'll have to spend spend all that money again, or you could play it safe and only rent the one item that you currently need. This is what makes the system work as well as it does, because just being able to buy the items outright at the very beginning of the game would effectively cripple the enjoyment of the game, because unlike Breath of the Wild, this game is still stuck within the confines of the classic Zelda formula, which is fundamentally built around the progression of items. By adding the risk of losing those items and having to reobtain them, you can funnel players into having a specific kind of playstyle that they want to have, either by just renting one item or a couple that you need at a time for progression's sake, or renting all of them and relying on their godlike gamer skills to save them, meaning even higher levels of shame when this bird thing comes to collect everything from you. Everyone wins this way. The system also makes players value rupees more. They're actually something useful that is worth going out of the way for, unlike a lot of other Zeldas. Challenge rooms and minigames, that are usually fun to do anyway, become extrinsically sought out so that you can either buy the item from Ravio, or as a bit of a safety net so you can rent it again should you die. But where the system falls apart a little bit, at least for me, is that the game is a bit too easy. I never find myself dying that often. It definitely still does happen, and I definitely do still lose all of my items a couple of times, but it's never enough of a discouragement from just renting them all again. Otherwise, I love this system. Now, if this were it for the progression, then already it would be a pretty solid game. But what launches it to status of 4th or 5th favorite Zelda, still can't decide between this and Spirit Tracks, and yes, I do legitimately believe that, is the wall merging mechanic and how it affects the relationship between Hyrule and Lowrule. This mechanic is what makes the game feel like its own distinct entry in the series and not just a sequel or reimagining. It fundamentally changes how you look at the world, and it's something that gives exploration more meaning than it had before. Sure, having access to what was in the past in endgame arsenal during the 
the whole adventure is a novel twist here, and it has the effect of changing the focus of exploring unknown territory rather than the Metroidvania-like approach. But since the map is only as big as it was in A Link to the Past, which was a fairly small map, it does lose a bit of its luster. Now, in addition to things that utilize the items, you now have walls no longer acting as a barrier, but as an alternative pathway. There are all sorts of things hidden along the walls, whether it's another ledge, a Mai Mai that can only be unstuck by getting behind it and on merging, it gives you more options to look into no matter where in the world you are. Unlike in A Link to the Past, where you could only access the Dark World with a portal in the Overworld, but could get back to the Light World from anywhere in the Dark World, A Link Between Worlds limits you to only being able to do this via these cracks in the wall throughout the world. This is easily my favorite change from A Link to the Past, especially given how Low Rule is designed. It's split up into seven sections, split apart via mountain ranges or huge chasms. Not only is it a cool way to visually demonstrate the state of the kingdom, but it also gives Hyrule a greater purpose during this latter portion of the game. One thing I didn't bring up in regards to A Link to the Past was how how, for the most part, the Dark World had a much greater focus in the game overall in comparison to the Light World. I don't consider this to be a problem necessarily, just something that makes the concept feel like there was more potential that it didn't quite reach. Here, they integrate the two worlds in a much more cohesive manner by comparison. The simplest way that I could describe my thoughts on this is that while you could make the argument that either game could be called A Link Between Worlds, only the latter really lives up to that with both its narrative and gameplay. This is just one of the most fun entries to explore in the series in general. And on top of the usual hard pieces, bottles and whatnot, there are also the Mayamais, the precursor to the Korok Seeds. They are a lot of fun to look for intrinsically, and much like the Korok Seeds, it adds a layer of explorative depth to the world, since they're hiding everywhere. Ten will allow you to upgrade your equipment, and with a hundred sprinkled across both high and low rule, it definitely feels quite fun to go after 100 to get the fully upgraded gear. Unlike the Korok Seeds, where the game actively discouraged you from going after all 900 of them. Or really any other reward like it in the series, like the Golden Skulltulas from Ocarina of Time, or Posols from Twilight Princess as examples, both of which stop being worthwhile at the halfway mark. The fact that any Zelda game has one of these side collectibles that I consider to be worth it both intrinsically and extrinsically is probably the biggest piece of praise that I could possibly bestow on the game. Now while this game has incredible overworld progression, the dungeons leave something to be desired with this particular approach to item progression. Let's talk about that. Easily the most requested change that people lobby towards Tears of the Kingdom, at least from what I've seen, is the return of traditional dungeons. But if this game is anything to go by, then honestly I really hope they don't. The Divine Beasts are a hot topic when it comes to Breath of the Wild, and it will be interesting to see how my perspective changes on them in a week. But for now, I think that they work within the greater context of Breath of the Wild. I don't want to repeat myself too much, since I already have a three and a half hour long video on the game that you can watch for my full thoughts, but here's the basics. The puzzles on display here, while fun, are disconnected from each other, which of course leads the Divine Beasts to feel a bit disjointed. They are relatively short, and while that short content is fairly enjoyable, it doesn't leave that much of an impression. However, something that I left out of that video is how it fits within the game as a whole. Previous Zelda games had a block of overworld time, followed by a block of dungeon time. Breath of the Wild took that and split it up. You are constantly weaving in and out of the dungeon block and the overworld block. In this context, the Divine Beasts are essentially just giant shrines. There is more story relevance surrounding them, and there is absolutely more gravitas involved with them, but if you split it up into a binary system of overworld and dungeon, then it's the same thing. My thoughts on them individually haven't changed one bit, but my thoughts on how they fit into the game as a whole have gotten a little more positive. My biggest hope is that Tears of the Kingdom takes its inspiration from the best elements of the Divine Beasts, and then expands on their best attributes to craft some truly phenomenal new experiences instead of returning to a style that has been worn out after decades of use. Now we finally get back to A Link Between Worlds. The dungeons in this game aren't bad by any means, but they also kind of feel like the Divine Beasts to me. Sure, they may have more of an aesthetic identity, and they're all fun, but ultimately there's just a lot of little things that leave me wanting more. These dungeons almost feel like a series of rooms that have fun puzzles, sometimes progression through the dungeon is cool, but it's hard to not feel like it's just going through the motions at this point, even if those motions are still great. Even the best dungeons in this game that I really enjoy just don't pack as much of a punch as the best that other games have to offer. It's not even that not getting a key item from the dungeons is the issue here, it's that the dungeon can only ever be based around a single item at a time. Practically all of the puzzles are easier to solve since they can only be based around either the item you have or wall merging. What this ultimately means is that despite the fact that there are differences in how they all look, there's a lack of identity outside of the items for me in the same way that people criticize the Divine Beast for how similar all four of them look. 
This is the hookshot dungeon. This is the hammer dungeon. This is the ice rod dungeon, etc. They generally have more coherent puzzle design, and I do enjoy the overall level design of these dungeons compared to what Breath of the Wild offered, but I also think that the Divine Beasts offered a new experience with some growing pains that, if allowed to mature, could allow for some really freaking sweet dungeons in the future. All of this to say, this is my mindset with going into talking about the dungeons from this game. When it comes down to it, there's just not a ton to say about them individually outside of whatever item the dungeon is based around. But this is a Josh the Camera Goo Zelda video, so I'll at least try. Eastern Palace is the least interesting dungeon in the game. A big reason why is because this is before you get the wall merging ability, so there's really not that much in the way of interesting puzzles. This doesn't matter though since it's the first dungeon in the game and those are always simple. After the Eastern Palace, there's the option to either go to the House of Gales or the Tower of Hera, and both of these dungeons are fairly solid. The House of Gales utilizes the Tornado Rod fairly well, and the puzzles are a nice little taste of what's to come next, with you having to find a way to hire ledges so that you can merge with the wall to get something important, in this case a key. None of it is too difficult, but it is a decent ramp up from before. The Tower of Hera is the best of this first set of dungeons. It utilizes the hammer fairly well, smashing these things down to springboard your way up and merging with the wall to explore both the interior and exterior of the dungeon. I really like the main theme here of slowly making your way up to the top. It's got a pretty good sense of progression to it. After this, the rest of the dungeons prior to Lower Hill Castle can be played in any order that you want. While in terms of difficulty progression, it means that it's flat, I think that it makes up for it with each of these dungeons having a central theme that they revolve around. It's similar to how each of the Divine Beasts move in a different way, which affects how you solve their individual puzzles. I know it's a weird comparison to make, but it's just what my mind goes to when I think about it. The Dark Palace has a fun buildup where you have to traverse through this maze in a decent little cell section before you access the actual dungeon, and it's a pretty good one. As the name would imply, the dungeon is dark. Some of the puzzles involve you having to diminish all the lights so that you can see a path that is only visible in the dark, and the structure is also somewhat disorienting. The puzzles are usually fairly satisfying, and it makes good use of the idea that this is a proper structure. The Swamp Palace is the one with the hookshot, which is usually the sign of a banger dungeon, and this one does not disappoint. Part of it is changing the water level, but it never asks you to consider the dungeon's layout as a whole like the best water dungeons do, only the immediate room that you're currently in. Otherwise, it's pretty good. The puzzles are all great, if not real brain teasers, and I like how zigzaggy the navigation ends up with you crossing overhead of this room a few times. Overall, a solid dungeon. I dislike Skull Woods from A Link to the Past, and I still dislike it here. It still shares a lot of the same issues that I had with the original version. There's not a lot that they put in the overworld that helps with the progression in the dungeon. It only serves to make the whole thing feel like disconnected mini dungeons that share the same theme. This does get a slight bump up over the original thanks to the wall masters. They make you do some pretty cool stuff with them here, like getting them to break walls or press buttons that are on a grate above you, stuff like that. So instead of just acting as a stressful slash annoying presence, it builds actual puzzles into it. That's pretty cool. Not enough to say the dungeon though. Turtle Rock is a really small dungeon, but it makes maneuvering around that small space into a puzzle in and of itself. There are a bunch of ledges and whatnot that you need to explore the entire space to find ways to get to. I particularly like having to map out all the teleporters in order to find the one that takes you to the key. It's a small layout, but it's incredibly dense, leading to a banger of a dungeon. The Ice Ruins is a really interesting dungeon that's very close to being my favorite dungeon in the game. Can't really decide between this one and Low Rule Castle. There's a central elevator which takes you to a ton of different floors, which masks progression in a subtle yet substantial way. Especially once you consider that a lot of the dungeon takes place in the exterior of the dungeon. From a pure navigation standpoint, this is easily the strongest in the game. The puzzles are also fairly solid as well, but it's the macro stuff that really captivates me. Thieves Hideout is probably the weakest dungeon from the low rule section. Its navigation and puzzles are all fairly solid, but neither of these are all that strong in comparison to the rest of the dungeons in this game. I do appreciate that it plays on your preconceived notions if you played on A Link to the Past beforehand, where the person you rescue turns into the boss at the end of the dungeon, which you would assume would be the case here only for it to turn out that the boss is completely different. It's a nice aversion. The Desert Palace is the only dungeon in the game that requires a prerequisite, that being the completion of the Thieves Hideout, which gives you access to the Sand Rod. I think that the puzzles and navigation are all pretty good. I like the ways in which the Sand Rod affects your approach to both of these, particularly navigation. It's not something that any of the other dungeons do with their items. It's also the only dungeon in the game to actually have a key item in it, those being the Titan Mitts. While there aren't a ton of huge boulders lifted throughout the dungeon, like in the Face Shrine from Link's Awakening for instance, it still does add a bit more of the traditionalist values that the dungeons of old clung to. 
Low Rule Castle actually has fairly simple navigation, all things considered. There are a few instances of it being a little tricky, but the really fun part of the dungeon comes from the four rooms at the end. They put to the test the majority of what you've learned throughout the game with a last hurrah to every type of puzzle that was present in the game. Navigating dark labyrinths, tricking wall masters into breaking walls and pressing buttons, using the hookshot to maneuver a raft alongside that, more difficult enemy encounters, and a couple of mini bosses. It feels like a better executed version of Ocarina of Time in Twilight Princess's final dungeons, and I already think that those two are fairly solid. Now, did you notice how much I kind of repeated myself throughout all of that? I hope that the fact I don't have a ton of original to say about each of them individually better helped illustrate my point. I really enjoy them, just like I really enjoy the Divine Beasts, but outside of Loro Castle, they never fully satisfy my dungeon cravings, much like the Divine Beasts. Perhaps this perspective isn't one that a lot of people will think is fair, and perhaps it feels as though I'm grasping at straws, but I think that playing the two of these games immediately one after the other brought out a lot of similarities in how I feel about them in a way that not even I expected. The bosses in A Link Between Worlds follow the same line of thinking. Most of them are fun, but a lot of them don't go beyond that. At this point, I've written an equivalent to my Breath of the Wild script for all these 2D Zelda videos, since for some reason I thought that writing them at the same time seemed to be a good idea. As such, I will be giving a 1-3 to three sentence description of all the bosses and base my opinion on them. I just want to be free of this misery. Margamil makes decent use of the Tornado Rod, though he's a bit too easy to take down. Moldorm is incredibly satisfying to beat with a hammer for the sole reason that I hated this boss and a link to the past. Otherwise, it's meh. Stallblind uses the wall merging mechanic in a fun way, with you having to merge with his shield to attack him from behind where he's unprotected. It's a simple use of it, but I think that it works. Only real problem is that he's a bit too simple to beat. Gemisaur King is a generally unmemorable boss, and he isn't particularly noteworthy in any positive or negative manner. Just throw a bomb to damage him. He drops rupees, and that's kind of based. Argus requires that you use the hookshot to take care of the eyes that surround him, and then you need to attack him once they are all gone. Knuckle Master is a fun fight that quickly turns annoying if you're stupid like me. All you need to do is merge with the wall to avoid getting hit and cause it to crash into the wall when it charges at you. This will allow you to attack its weak point. The floor falls apart over the course of the fight, so it gets trickier to maneuver through the arena. For whatever reason, I suck at this boss, so it usually takes 5 million years for me to beat. It starts out fun, but quickly turns sour because of my lack of skill. Grinix has you needing to draw blocks of ice using the ice rod. Then in the second phase, you just need to attack his head when it pops out. It's a fun fight. Dark Stare has you needing to use the fire rod to melt the ice block around him. Then you just need to attack with your sword afterwards. It would be an interesting fight if the fire rod weren't so overpowered. Zaganag uses the sand rod to create a platform to access him to damage him. The fight can be a little needlessly frustrated sometimes with where he's placed and how it expects you to get to him. Otherwise, it's a solid use of the sand rod to create a boss around around it. Finally, there's Yuga. The first fight is relatively easy, just pay attention to which Yuga is the real one and attack him. Then you just need to follow his path along the wall while avoiding his attacks. It's not that difficult. The second fight at the end of the game is where things get good. Much like the typical Ganon fight, just avoid his trident as he swings his trident. The battle gets progressively more difficult, with him throwing his trident around the room as well as energy balls that you need to dodge. I really enjoyed the challenge that this first phase offers. The second phase starts with the typical energy tennis Zelda shtick before it transitions to a section where you merge with the wall to shoot him with a bow of light. I really enjoyed the second phase. It utilizes the wall merging mechanic in a much more substantial way than other bosses, and is generally just really enjoyable. I would normally say more about the bosses, the dungeons, and all that, but I have reached my limit with what I can stand talking about with Zelda games, so without further ado, let's wrap up this whole retrospective series. A Link Between Worlds is a stepping stone between what Zelda had become and what it was soon to be. Breath of the Wild was a radical shift for the series, one that I, and a lot of people, would say is a good shift. But in the process, I think it's easy to neglect what A Link Between Worlds brought to the table. It paved the way for Breath of the Wild to break conventions by starting to break them itself. With its approach to item progression and its rejection of the linearity that Zelda kind of bathed in for a while. I'm surprised that I had so little to say about it in comparison to some of the other games I looked at for this series. I don't know if that's just the fatigue of writing all these stupid things in one go instead of spacing them out like I did for the 3D retrospective, or if that had any effect on it at all. Regardless of that, however, A Link Between Worlds offers a unique experience that no other Zelda can quite match.
which is something that can be said about pretty much every 2D Zelda game when you think about it. I found that every time I started on a new script for this series, the first thing that I would write in regards to the game I was talking about in that video was how it was a weird game. Link's Awakening is an officially made parody. The Oracle games are interconnected stories that each focus on a different aspect of the series. The DS Zelda games and their entire existence, and a Link Between Worlds hybrid of reimagining sequel and original game. The 3D games are comparatively more uniform. That's not a bad thing by any means, I actually prefer the 3D games over the 2D ones generally, but it is something that gives the 2D games a unique edge, and I miss that. It's been 8 years since the release of the last 2D Zelda game, 19 years since the last 2D Zelda on a console, and if for whatever reason you don't want to count the multiplayer titles, then it's been 10 years since the last 2D Zelda, and over 30 since the last one on home consoles. Ever since the Switch was announced, I had hoped that we would finally get a brand new 2D adventure, but with Tears of the Kingdom releasing in a week, the pattern of Nintendo consoles usually ending around a year after the big 3D Zelda, along with all the rumors of new hardware, I think that the chances of Switch getting an original 2D Zelda are officially over. Maybe the next system, but it's more likely to be a remake of a pre-existing game like the Oracle games or Minish Cap than it is to be a from the ground up title. I'll always be excited for whatever the series puts out because it's a series that means a lot to me, but it still kind of sucks that 2D Zelda has been neglected for this long. If there are no new 2D Zelda games for a long time from now though, I won't be too upset. Because as long as I've got Link's Awakening, Oracle of Ages, Oracle of Seasons, Phantom Hourglass, Spear Tracks, and A Link Between Worlds, then I'll be okay. Because these games are infinitely replayable. They capture something that so few other games do. And despite their issues, I would argue that they are some of the finest games Nintendo has ever put out.